Seven Wings, Book One. And remember the reason we fly. Prologue. Valerie. If your first experience with witnessing death is any indication of how you'll deal with your own, I'm screwed. I couldn't have been any older than six or seven when I carried the fishbowl over to the toilet. I knew what I had to do, and I'd even prepared myself when the world's most magnificent beta fish stopped picking at the multicolored flakes. I swallowed a lump in my throat and, without special words or ceremony, dumped the bowl's contents into the watery grave. I don't remember what I had named the fish, only that it missed the bowl and stuck to the back rim of the toilet. Maybe I was too scared to touch it, too ashamed to tell someone, or not ready to say goodbye. But from that point forward, I began sitting further forward when I did my business and watched my fish decay one day at a time until it was nothing but an unidentifiable stain. I'd appreciate it if you'd keep that in mind moving forward, because some may say I handled my own death just as badly. You be the judge. Chapter 1 Valerie my whole life was torn away from me at once, like water slipping through my fingers. The tighter I clenched my fists to hold it, the faster the scattered pieces left me. My memories, my dreams, and the people I loved were all lost to darkness. My heart strained to hold on to someone's voice, but it fell away a moment after the rest. Everything I was... lost... Pitch black and cold, the clang of metal spat me into the belly of chaos. My eyes fought to adjust as I squinted against shadows. I could feel movement and smell the rusty ache of bloodlust in the air. Before I could orient myself, something large rushed at me. A lightning bolt crackled through the black sky as a massive fanged beast the size of a truck raised a taloned hand to impale me. Fear stole the scream from my throat and I crossed my arms in front of me, knowing full well there was nothing to be done. I felt a sudden gust of air as a mass moved in front of me, blocking the monster. Thunder crackled, shaking the darkness, and I peeked, catching a glimpse of a winged creature with its back to me and its wings outstretched. Every muscle in my body tightened. The clash of battle resounded through the air, but even if I could see through the shadows... I was too afraid to look back. I backed away from the skirmish and felt my heels dip off an edge. I leaned forward to catch myself, my heart slamming down harder with each wild beat. I turned back and waved my hands over the emptiness, my hair whipping in the wind. My muscles shook as lightning struck again, and I gaped at the cliff-like platform I was trapped on and the creatures battling above. The winged one ran toward me, her form was draped in light from a flash of lightning, and in a moment, I saw she was a girl with sun-kissed skin and pink hair, no older than twenty-one. Her eyebrows pressed together in a mix of determination and fear. She wore battle armor that was caked with a black substance, but my gaze locked on the two giant wings that jutted out of her back. Her gaze met mine, and I didn't know why— but I was sure she was there to help me. I reached for her as she neared. Help me! I yelled, relief pouring into me as she strode closer. The lightning's light was swallowed by blackness. With the force of ten men, she shoved me back. I flew over the edge and plummeted into the vast and empty dark. The wind beat against me, and it was too dark to predict which moment would be my last. I strained for air, uselessly waving my hands in front of me as if I could somehow catch myself. I surrendered, relieved by the futility of it. There was nothing for me to see, nothing I could do to save myself. 
My mind reached out to think about a loved one, one last time, but there were no memories to call upon. Then, I felt someone's arms wrap around me gently, and my descent eased. I braced myself for pain, but my rescuer lifted me softly. I felt the powerful stroke of wings against the air as we rose together. Was it the girl who pushed me? Had she come back? My stomach dropped from the quick change in direction, and nausea threatened to make me spew the contents of my stomach. I closed my eyes and felt my rescuer's grip tighten. Then he spoke, his voice husky and low. You're safe now, Valerie. We got you back. The darkness split, and the world beyond opened up. The cold white light pierced my head as my eyes adjusted to the new extreme. I didn't dare look down. Instead, I looked at the man who held me. Like the girl who had pushed me off the cliff, he was caked in an ashy substance. But I could also see fresh, red blood dripping from a cut on his neck. His black wings stretched, and we glided down to a smooth stop. The moment we landed, I pushed out of his arms and backed away. Calm down, Valerie. My pulse was in my throat, my vision blurring. I don't... I don't... I know you hate me, but your heart rate is too fast, so calm down. My head began to bob, and I doubled over to rest my hands on my knees. My thoughts were jumbled, my memories absent. All I had was fear. Don't close your eyes, Val. Look at me. I felt a rush of air as another presence joined him, but I couldn't catch my breath enough to look up. Was Valerie hurt? A new voice said, this one with an accent I couldn't quite place. Oh, great. Another bird man. I don't know who that is, I said finally. What do you mean? My rescuer asked. Who the heck is Valerie? It only occurred to me after I asked the question that he might have been referring to me. While the name didn't sound familiar in the least, I had no name of my own to offer. I had nothing at all. The wind whipped me as I was lifted again and carried away from the noise. I squeezed my eyes shut as the light suddenly slammed down on me. I peeked my eyes open, taking a deep breath as they adjusted, and found myself on a wide, empty field with long, lazy blades of grain that shifted in the breeze. My stomach moved to my throat as we dropped into a sharp descent, but we landed softly. My rescuer put me down, and I scanned the area, trying to orient myself. There was no darkness in sight, and no terrible beasts to be seen either. The two strangers watched with concern I couldn't help but share as I took it all in. Now that I could get a good look at the two, I saw that the man who'd rescued me had broad shoulders, sandy skin, and midnight black eyes that seemed inappropriately tense. His dark hair stuck to his forehead, and it looked like whatever battle he'd pulled me out of had been a bad one. The other man was comparatively clean and uninjured, so I immediately felt more comfortable with him. He was bald and had dark brown skin and pointed ears. His dark goatee framed the fullness of his lips, and the ends of his massive black wings had red feathers at the tips that I found beautiful. What's happening? I asked, finding my voice. They exchanged a glance, and the dark-skinned man spoke. You don't know us? Should I? My rescuer turned away, and the other man put a hand on his shoulder for comfort, but he shrugged away the gesture and, with a flap of his charcoal wings, lifted into the air. I watched him go, unsure of what my role had been in whatever had just happened. I couldn't remember my name or anything about my life, but surely this was hell with all the monsters and bird people lurking around. Um, sorry about your friend. If you could just point me in the direction of the so-called pearly gates, I'll be on my way. He shook his head and sighed. Lily, he whispered. Dusk isn't playing fair. I dusted something pink off my shoulder, only to find it was my own hair. 
It wasn't all pink like the bird girl from the dark place, just the ends. For some reason, it didn't seem like it belonged to me. The man with the red-tipped wings held out his hand. My name is Thorn. I shook it. I... I... Um... Crap. I had no name. What was the name they said? Mallory? Your name is Valerie. Let's get you cleaned up, and we can fill you in on everything that's going on. Look, if I'm dead, you can tell me. I said, hoping to ease his apprehension. He forced a smile. You're taking this remarkably well. I wiped my mouth. I'm pretty sure I threw up somewhere. He smiled, his gaze softening, and to my surprise, his wings didn't spread. Instead, he began to walk, and for some reason, I followed. Chapter 2 Valerie I walked beside Thorn, trying not to get caught stealing glances at his pointed ears or massive wings, but my curiosity got the best of me. So, uh, are you a birdman or, like, an angel or something? He smiled, but never made eye contact. I'm a Valkyrie. I nodded. Cool, cool. Is everyone around here one of those? There are five left. I gulped. Left? He stopped short, and I traced his gaze, my mouth dropping open as the field ended and paradise began. Clouds kissed the edges of the field like orange domes that stretched across the sky. A golden bridge reached across to a sand-colored city, woven into a cloudy plain. We headed for the bridge, each step forward revealing a new marvel. Stacked structures with arched doors and windows peeked through the mist, jutting out as if reaching for the sky itself. It was a marvel of a structure, obscured by the shifting veil of clouds. What is this place? The Lux Realm. A large wall encircled the floating island, with its only gate waiting to welcome us at the end of the bridge. So I am dead. Nope, but not for lack of trying. This is a sort of in-between. What do you mean? He shrugged, reluctant. I don't want to overwhelm you. I have a feeling all this might be a bit much to take in at once. A shadow passed over the bridge, and I spun to see a being flying above toward the city. A gasp escaped my lips. Based on its size, I'd expected to see a person connected to those wings. But this was just a giant bird. Its razor-sharp beak gleamed in the sunlight, its talons like daggers jutting out of its claws. I froze, and my gaze shifted to Thorn. Was this monstrous thing a threat? He watched me curiously. The bird let out a cry that rattled me to my core. I clutched onto Thorn and ducked behind him, using him as a human shield. He laughed as the bird dove for us. I peeked out from behind Thorn, only to see it grow in size as it approached, and it was far larger than I'd feared. Instead of attacking, it banked right and circled us twice, its beady, honey-brown eye affixed to me. I held my breath, turning to keep it in front of me. A crackling sound tore through the beast, and I watched in horror as its feathers receded and its body contorted. It dropped like a rock, and if it hadn't been so large, I might have instinctively run to catch it. By the time it hit the ground, it was a man. He was shirtless, tan, and grinning ear to ear. He was notably the first person I'd seen without wings aside from me. He ran to me, and I froze as he took my face in his hands and put his forehead to mine. Valerie! He pulled away, tearing up. You... you were just a bird. He backed away slowly, the smile dropping from his face as he turned to Thorn. What's wrong with her? Thorn shook his head. She doesn't remember anything. The man turned to me, his face almost as sad as my rescuers had been. Nothing? Didn't even know her own name. Does Jamin know? Thorn nodded. He, uh, he's going to need some time. 
I felt a pang of guilt. I didn't know these people, but they seemed to care about me. I almost wished I could rewind time and pretend I knew the Birdman, just to see the happiness on his face again. It seemed like my lack of memory was hurting people, as if the empty spaces where memories should have been weren't lonely enough. I'm Farage, he said, but there was no longer any joy on his face. You shouldn't go in this way. The whole city will be happy to see her, and I doubt she'll want that much attention, especially if she doesn't know what's going on. How did you turn into a bird? I asked. I looked at Thorn. Can you do that? He shook his head. Because I'm cool like that, Farage said with a smile. So you're a birdman then? Valkyrie, he said. Thorn shook his head. What's with you and birdmen? He was literally just a bird. Would you mind if I fly you in instead of walking? Thorn asked. I shook my head. Feathers began to sprout on Farage's arms. I'm going to find Jamin. With a horrible crunching sound, he shifted back into bird form and flew off. Thorn reached for me, but I raised my hands to stop him. I don't like this. Panic rose inside of me, and my mind strained for something comforting or familiar, but there was nothing. What were those monster things? What was that dark place? He grabbed my shoulders. You're safe here, I promise. My ears pricked and tears began to fall. Thorn pulled me to his chest for a hug, and I let him, nuzzling into his chest. I can't imagine how frightened you must be. I'm going to figure out a way to get your memories back, and when I do, everything will make sense. And perhaps you'll be able to shed some light on a few things for the rest of us as well. He stepped back. All right, get tough. He flexed his arms, and his expression became determined. I wiped my nose and mirrored him. I felt silly, but it helped a little. Chapter 3 Valerie Even though I was prepared for it, when Thorn's massive wings thrust down and we lifted into the air, my stomach dropped and my breath caught. But that was nothing compared to getting an aerial view of the city. Smooth stones mosaiced the streets in swirling patterns, and crowds of wingless people waved to us as we soared above. The sun beamed the full brunt of the late afternoon rays like a spotlight onto a palace that sat at the city's center, and all the inclining pathways wove through arched structures leading there. Lush vines crawled up golden banisters and spilled out over the edges, reaching for the clouds, and there were floating buildings with steepled roofs that turned slowly like wind chimes. Thorn's wings leveled and we glided down toward the castle. A child called my name from below, but we were moving too quickly for me to get a good look. We approached a palace for our final descent and gaped at the way the light poured in through glassless windows and splashed across the tile floor. There was a golden bell at the center of the room and an empty throne at the back. We landed and Thorn put me down. Where's your king? I asked, eyeing the throne, but instead of answering, Thorn walked straight to the bell and rang it by slamming the clapper from one side to the other. The sound echoed through every part of the throne room. It was bright and clear and I felt my body tense instinctively as if it remembered what I couldn't. I knew from the way Thorn watched the windows that we were expecting company. I was surprised when the front door opened and a woman walked in. She was pale-skinned with warm brown hair that had flowers pinned in it. Her face brightened when she saw me, and even as she rushed over, I could see in her a demeanor that was calming. One white wing jutted from her back, and she leaned a little as if to balance the weight of where another should have been. Valerie! Her voice was gentle even when she shouted. I smiled, eager not to disappoint her, but Thorn stepped between us before she got to me. She stopped short, her neat brows pushed together in confusion, but before Thorn could explain, someone flew through the window. I recognized her from her pink hair as the girl from the dark place. Only her hair was wet, 
and she was no longer covered in all that black stuff I had seen earlier. Unlike the others, she had a pair of enviable pink wings with a bit of gray in the middle. I barely batted an eye when the giant bird flew in after her, as I remembered Farage, but I wasn't necessarily looking forward to hearing the cracking of his bones as he shifted. It happened quickly as he dropped into his human form alongside the guy who rescued me earlier. Jamin, right? Like the pink-haired girl, his hair was wet, and now that he was no longer covered in black gunk, I was struck by how handsome he was. I tried not to stare, but it wasn't like he'd notice if I did. His gaze was locked on the bell, and I could feel him avoiding looking at me, along with everyone else. I'd made him angry somehow, but it didn't seem like the time to make amends. I watched the windows for more people to arrive, but Thorn cleared his throat, stealing my attention. As you can see, Valerie has returned. Unfortunately, she doesn't remember anything about the past or even who she is. The girl with a missing wing gasped, covering her mouth with her hands. It looks like she'll have to earn back her wings, too, Farage added. My rescuer rolled his eyes. Don't you think it's a little convenient that she shows up here a few months before the next eclipse? Thorn turned to me. You think she's a traitor? I'd had enough. Can everybody stop talking about me like I'm not here? How do we even know she's telling the truth about not remembering? Jamin asked, without so much as a glance in my direction. The rest all looked me over, and heat burned my face. Finally, the pink-haired girl shook her head. No, she wouldn't betray us. I know her too well. Better than I knew Ajax? Jamin asked, his voice sharp and cold. He walked over, locking eyes with me in a glare, his fierce gaze scorching my face. No one believed in you more than I did. You made a fool out of me once, and I'll be damned if I let that happen again. I chewed the inside of my cheek. This was obviously personal for him. I could see the hurt in his eyes and the anger, but I didn't know the girl he was talking about. Whether you remember or not, I know what you did, he said through gritted teeth. I swallowed a lump in my throat as tears threatened to fall from my eyes. Who the heck did this guy think he was, talking to me like that? My limbs moved instinctively, and I shoved him. I don't know much, but I know I'm not a traitor. He closed the gap between us. Liar! For the briefest second, his gaze moved to my lips, and the heat that passed between us seemed like something other than anger. Enough. Thorn stepped between us. Ciel will train her, and Jamin can take her post at the rupture. Excuse me? I asked, looking around. Train me for what? Farage answered. To become a Valkyrie again. What if I don't want to be a Valkyrie? The room fell silent, so I elaborated. Three of you are wearing swords and armor. Valkyries fight, right? Count me out. Farage looked over at Jamin. Still think she's faking? Jamin's gaze met mine, and I felt a flood of heat push through my body. His eyes narrowed, and he walked toward me, the tips of his black wings dragging on the floor behind him. He stopped, standing close, and I held my breath as the room went silent. My heart raced. Are you afraid of me? He asked. I wasn't sure what I felt. Feverish, perhaps? I couldn't entirely rule out fear. I nodded. Good, because if I find out you're lying about any of this, I'll drive my sword through your chest. I'm Irina, a soft voice interjected, and I turned to see the girl with one wing. That's Jamin. He means no harm. Farage was the one who changed from a hawk. CL has the pink hair and you know Thorn. We were all friends once. I glared at Jamin. Are you sure? Even this guy? There was a collective giggle and Jamin turned away in a huff and went to sulk over by the bell. A smile crept onto my face and CL stepped forward, brushing a strand of pink hair out of her eyes. Remember me? Of course. 
You pushed me off a cliff. She puffed up her chest proudly. Damn right I did. But I knew Jay would catch you. Weird that you trusted him. He seems kind of like a jerk. She sighed. The cute ones always are. My chest warmed. She smiled at me, and I could see her searching for something in me. You and I were friends, huh? Best friends, she corrected. Chapter 4 Valerie I stood on a balcony beside C.L. and Farage with my elbows propped up on the banister and my face leaned over the edge. We watched as the setting sun lit up the clouds in a dazzling display of pinks and oranges that seemed close enough to touch. Each mass glowed with such a defined shape. It was hard to believe my hands would pass through if I touched them. So this is my home, I said, half to myself. A sudden gust tossed C.L.'s hair, and it tickled my cheek. She murmured in agreement. And I used to spend most of my time with you two? Faraj's eyebrows rose, and he exchanged a loaded glance with C.L. Come on, I feel like everyone is hiding things from me. Faraj wrapped his arms around my shoulder. It's not like that, I swear. It's just very complicated. Well, maybe if you guys told me everything, my memories would return. Did I do something bad? Is there a reason nobody trusts me? C.L. turned away and returned her gaze to the sunset. The others don't know what to make of you yet. We're all curious about what happened the night you left, and you're not able to fill in the gaps for us. They might come around if you agreed to become a Valkyrie again. And I'd have to fight those monsters? And go to the dark place? She nodded. Then I can't. I may not remember who I am, but I know I can't do that. I can't go back to that dark place, and I definitely can't kill one of those things. I'm sorry to disappoint you. CL smirked and leaped onto the banister. But you'd get wings. Nerves shot through me as she leaned over the edge. But her wings spread, and she glided into the clouds, her pink hair mixing with the sunset. Tempting, no? Farage asked with a wink. I'll admit, flying seems amazing, but I'm not sure I'm the person everyone thinks I am. He shrugged. Well, maybe you should figure out who that person was before you decide. Then tell me something you remember about me. His brown eyes followed C.L. as she dipped in and out of view, twirling through the mounds of cotton candy. You were the bravest of all of us. Well, that can't be true. There you are. I spun to see a boy no older than ten doubled over with his hands on his knees. He was out of breath, but had the brightest smile. Valerie, you're back. Argus, Farage greeted him. She's lost her memory. What? Really? Unlike the others, his smile didn't fade. Instead, his eyes bulged with curiosity. His dark curls bounced when he moved. He was missing a tooth, and I swear he had the most infectious enthusiasm I'd ever seen. You don't remember me? He asked. Argus, right? I said, hoping to spare him some disappointment. She doesn't even know who she is, Farage pointed out. That's easy. You're the greatest Valkyrie of all time. Ouch, man, Farage teased. Oh, you're good too. It's just Valerie is better. Farage crossed his arms. And the hits keep on coming. I told them you'd be back, Valerie, but I didn't think it would take so long and I thought you'd still have your wings. But I'm sure you'll earn them back. I had wings? Look, kid, I'm not sure I want to be a Valkyrie. He gasped. What? Being a Valkyrie is the best thing in the world. Someday I'll be one just like you, and we can fight together. You're not scared of those monsters? Do you mean the Riven? Of course I'm scared. Everyone's scared. But that's why we have Valkyries. He turned to Farage. Is Ajax back too? 
Faraz shook his head, raising his eyebrows to stop Argus from saying more. Why don't we give Valerie a little time to settle in? Does that mean you want me to leave? At this point, I interjected. Let him stay. He's the only one who's telling me stuff. You're my new favorite, Argus. He jumped, pumping a fist in the air. Now, Argus, tell me what I need to know. He shrugged. Like what? I don't know. How do I not get eaten by those horrible monsters? Faraj sighed and walked back inside the palace. You're safe here. Just stay in the city and don't go outside at night. Just in case. I nodded. So how many winged people are there? Valkyries? There were seven, including you. CL rose above the clouds, and as she headed back to us, I could feel my window of opportunity to get information closing quickly. Where did I go? He shifted, his gaze moving between CL and me. I don't know. There was a bad night a year ago, and lots of people died. You were gone after that. CL perched on the banister. Argus, you found us, she said with a smile. You better get home before sunset, or else the Riven will snatch you. Can I come to watch you train tomorrow? Argus asked me. I didn't want to disappoint him, but nothing I'd learned today had endeared me to the idea of becoming a Valkyrie. They were tough fighters if they took on those scary things, so what could I offer them? Plus, they all seemed guarded. Maybe if I began to train with them, they'd trust me more, but there was no way I was going to willingly fight one of those monsters. I'm still kind of deciding. Argus gave me a small smile and then waved and took off running down the stairs. The pink hues of the sky turned to purples and a silvery gray as CL hopped down and put her hand on my shoulder. We'd better get you home, too. It might help jog some of your memories. Sure, okay. CL? Yeah? Thank you for today. I know it must be hard for you to see me like this. She took a deep, slow breath. It's weird because you're still you. You just don't know it yet. I hadn't realized just how tired I was until CL began to walk me home. I had hoped it would have the same comforting and familiar feeling that spending time with CL did and would perhaps shed some light on what kind of person I was. As CL and I walked, I cataloged what I'd learned, despite the many questions that still swirled inside my head. I'd met most of the Valkyries, five in fact, Thorn, Irina, Faraj, CL, and Jamin. Supposedly, I used to be one too, which left me with a burning question about a name I'd heard mentioned several times today. Who was Ajax, and what had happened to him? Chapter 5 Valerie The city didn't lose an ounce of beauty after sunset. The stars shone bright, seeming particularly close, and the moon was so radiant that the world almost looked like a silvery day. The streets were notably empty, and warm light poured out of the windows of the homes that were tucked into the hilly landscape. CL led quietly, her wings crossed behind her. I was emotionally drained from the day, but I dreaded going back to a home I couldn't remember and having to leave CL's side, especially after that little tidbit she'd said to Argus about being snatched by a riven. I shuddered. CL, what do you like about being a Valkyrie? She considered my question for a moment, then stopped and turned to face me. Well, the reality is that sometimes ribbons get through. I suppose it feels good to take matters into my own hands. I feel powerful. She put her hand on my head, an odd gesture that made me smile. Get some rest. We're here to keep you safe. I wasn't sure what I'd expected, but the arched door looked like all the others. Cozy and inviting. Ah, the key, CL said, patting herself down. I reached for the doorknob, and it opened. It's not locked. Oh, well, welcome home. 
I went directly in, and the room lit immediately, but I couldn't tell from where. There were no bulbs or candles around, just a warm, even glow around the cozy apartment. A familiar scent filled my nose, a mix of spearmint and freshly cut grass. There was a small staircase that led to a loft that had a ceiling so low that I couldn't stand to my full height. It had a small kitchen, a desk with a silver dagger laid across it, and a door at the back that I assumed led to a bathroom. What do you think? C.L. asked. I love it, I said, drinking in its details, but feeling a little too much like an imposter to be comfortable. Does it jog any memories? I shrugged. Not really. The smell, a little bit. How does all this stuff work? All what stuff? The lights, the, uh, bathroom situation? She smiled. Ah, uh, it's similar to regular life. This realm sort of mirrors it, in a sense. Regular life? Well, specifics of your life on Earth return to you when you move on. It happens to everyone here. It's normal for dwellers not to have personal memories when they arrive. It's weird for you, though, because you're a Valkyrie. You've been here before. I immediately regretted asking. I had no clue what she meant by any of that. She must have read my perplexed expression. Are you hungry? I can try to make you something, she asked. I shook my head. Thanks, but I think I'm just going to crash. I'm wiped out. Cool, because Jamin's going to kill me if I don't relieve him of his post. I'll either come here to get you in the morning, or one of the others will. Okay, but maybe not Jamin. He hasn't quite warmed up to me yet. She pressed her lips together, her eyebrows raising as she nodded. I couldn't help but note the mischievousness in her expression, but before I could think anything more of it, she left. I stood feeling out of place in the center of the apartment where C.L. had left me, too exhausted to want to go through the space collecting the puzzle pieces that made up my former life. I walked up the stairs and plopped into the bed. I stretched my arms over my head, pulling out a yawn. I'll have no trouble falling asleep tonight. I heard a thud and shot up. I looked around and saw a book lying on the floor beside the bed. My heartbeat settled as I picked it up. The riven had put me on edge. I opened the book and saw that the pages were lined, but the first fourth of it had been torn out. It might have been some kind of journal, which would have been a huge help in discovering who I was. It's odd that the pages are missing. I ran my fingers over the paper and felt the impressions of the pen marks from the previous missing page. It's not bright enough to see. As soon as the thought passed through my head, the room brightened, and I squinted at the page to try to make out what it said. The indents of two short sentences remained clear as day on the first line. I wouldn't have thought two sentences were enough to give me any real insight into who I was. But these did just that. I read them again and again, and each time, the loss of my memory hurt worse. I love him, but he'd never understand— Ajax is the only one who will listen. Was I in love with someone? And who exactly was Ajax anyway? And why hadn't I met him yet? I crawled back into bed and went to sleep, but didn't rest. There was too much uncertainty to comb through. That night, I dreamed of someone I'd never met. A man with olive green eyes and thick black eyelashes stood in the darkness with his hand outstretched. Valerie! I jolted awake, and morning light poured into my apartment through the window, the cheerful chirp of birds promising me a new day. The dream slipped away, but my journal still lay beside me, and my mind echoed the two sentences I'd found imprinted the night before. They were clues. Even if the Valkyries weren't forthcoming, now that I knew what to look for, I was sure I'd get to the bottom of it quickly. Chapter 6. Valerie Someone knocked at my door, rousing me before I had officially decided to get out of bed. I hoped to see C.L. as I hurried down the stairs, but when I pulled the door open, 
I was surprised to see Irina standing alongside Argus. Good morning, Valerie. Her voice was warm. Irina, right? I asked. Suddenly concerned about the state of my bedhead, I pawed at the brown and pink locks as I gestured them both in. Right. Do you remember me? Argus asked. Argus, of course. He grinned. We're going to breakfast, Irina stated, waving me on to join them. I looked at the jeans and tank top I had on from yesterday, and then at her floor-length dress. Is this okay? She bit back a laugh. What? You never used to care much about what you wore, but if you'd feel more comfortable in a dress, I bought you one for your birthday last year, and I'm sure it's around here somewhere. Argus groaned. How long is this going to take? Irina's hand began to spark. I saw a flash of lightning in her palm and then another. Argus stood on his tiptoes to get a better look as more sparks gathered on her palm, forming a ball of lightning. I watched in awe as she handed it to Argus. Here, this should keep you occupied for a while. Meet you at breakfast. Argus practically squealed as he took the crackling ball from her hand and hurried out of my apartment without so much as a goodbye. Irina turned to me, and I could see her plotting how she'd make me over. By the time I'd bathed and Irina had pinned half my hair up and gotten me into a dress, almost a full hour had elapsed. It was easy to spend time with her. She wasn't as much of a talker as Farage or CL, but the silence was comfortable enough to put me at ease. So, you can cast magic? I asked as we made our way up the winding roads to the castle. Is that something a lot of people can do, or is that more of a you thing? All of the Valkyries have special abilities. They're different for everyone. I can manipulate lightning and heal injuries. So, what you're saying is, you're kind of a big deal around here. She winked. I wondered what my ability had been, but it didn't seem appropriate to ask, especially when what I really wanted to know was a much more inappropriate question for a stranger to ask. How had she lost a wing? She led me toward the castle, and I could see between the straps of her dress that she had a scar that ran from her empty shoulder blade up to the back of her neck. She'd tell me when she was ready, or perhaps a moment would arise when it felt more natural to ask. I liked the way the yellow floor-length dress Irina had found for me flowed in the wind, but more importantly, I liked how unnatural it felt to wear it. I knew as soon as I got it on that it wasn't the type of thing I often wore. It didn't feel right. It didn't feel like me. But discovering a part of me that had been locked away inside made me feel like I had hope of someday recovering my memories. We headed out into the city. The early morning view was decidedly my favorite. The clouds spilled into the streets, and the fragmented rays of sun slipped through to shine spotted patterns across the mosaic stones. But my favorite part was that this morning, the streets were bustling with dwellers, as CL had called them. They stood in groups and chatted, no one rushing around or in a hurry. They were all different races and colors, with no obvious family members that looked similar enough to identify right away. They smiled and watched us pass. I was so overcome by the feeling of goodwill that it was almost like the dark place and the monsters that lurked there had never existed at all. The walk up to the castle was steeper than I remembered from walking down it last night, and I was practically out of breath by the time we reached the palace. We walked through the double doors, and this time, the sun didn't beam directly in. Irina banked right, and I followed her down a corridor. I stopped short when I noticed the tapestries hanging on one of the walls. There were seven portraits made with saturated colors and intricate detailing that stretched from floor to ceiling. Each tapestry was at least 20 feet tall, and I recognized the man in the first one as Thorn. The artist had managed to capture the essence of his powerful but kind presence. Irina turned. The dining room is just at the end of this hall. I'm supposed to help set up. Come along when you're ready. I smiled, nodding my thanks, and she left me there to admire the portraits. The next portrait was CL, captured just as she was landing. 
Her pink hair tossed above her hair in the wind. She had more of the fierce warrior spirit from the first time I'd seen her than the charismatic girl I'd met at the palace. Farage was pictured mid-shift, but I barely looked at it for more than a second because, in my periphery, I saw my own portrait. I stood in front of it, gazing up at the powerful Valkyrie. It was hard to believe that the dagger-toting badass with those beautiful, fluffy white wings and fierce blue eyes was me. I looked down at my tawny, tanned skin and back up at the portrait. I didn't feel as strong as that girl looked. As strange as looking at it was, it was nothing compared to the portrait on the next tapestry. I'd seen those olive green eyes. They triggered a memory I could almost reach. The man in the portrait had a square jaw and streaked white and black hair. He was the only person I didn't recognize on the wall. I stopped when I got to the last portrait. Jamin. My thoughts went immediately to his impassioned accusations against me. A real ray of sunshine that guy is. But CL was right. He is pretty handsome. My face warmed as I traced over every detail of the image. How could I make amends if I didn't even know what I had done? His eyes were dark and intense, his cheekbones high, and a gentle smile touched his lips. It was an expression I hadn't witnessed from him in person, and I thought he looked angelic with his hand outstretched and his gaze angled down as if he was looking at me. Someone cleared their throat behind me, and I nearly jumped out of my skin. I whirled to see that Jamin was standing a few feet away with his hands in his pockets. He wore a black suit with a black shirt that had the top three buttons undone. He watched me closely, his gaze burning my skin, and I thought I saw the faintest blush on the same cheekbones I'd been admiring on his portrait a moment earlier. Jamin's gaze swept over me, and I suddenly felt self-conscious about wearing a dress. He stared at me like he was seeing a ghost, and instead of saying hello, he waited as if expecting me to defend myself. Get over yourself, dude. I was looking at all the pictures. When I said nothing, he continued on, brushing past me. Then his scent hit me, a delicious spearmint that made my mouth water. It was familiar, but not from lost memories, from recent ones. My apartment. My eyes narrowed as I strung together everything that had seemed off yesterday. The spearmint scent, the missing pages of my diary, my unlocked door. You were in my apartment last night, weren't you? He stopped only for a second, then continued on like my question wasn't worth answering. Chapter 7 Valerie I was pleasantly surprised to find the meal hadn't started yet when I entered the dining room. Farage and Argus were tossing Irina's electricity ball back and forth by the windows at the back. Their hair stood on end, and they giggled mischievously. The large banquet table stretched across half the room, but Thorne and Irina only carried the plates of food on the far end, where Jamin was already seated with his arms crossed. A giant crystal chandelier scattered refracted glittering light around the room every time the air so much as brushed against it. CL wasn't around yet, and I wondered if she'd be joining us or if she was charged with guarding the rupture until someone could take over for her. Have a seat anywhere, Irina called across the room. Jamin refused to make eye contact, so to spite him, I sat down directly across from him. He could at least be civil. He lifted his gaze to meet mine, and I could see irritation burning behind his charcoal black eyes. There are a ton of open seats. Why do you have to pick that one? He asked, spite dripping from his words. Look, since I don't remember what happened before and therefore can't defend myself, how about we start over? How about you leave me the hell alone? He picked up a crystal cup and took a sip of water. What a complete waste of handsomeness. The guy had it out for me, way worse than any of the other Valkyries seemed to. Did you and I used to date? I'm getting serious ex-boyfriend vibes here. 
He choked, and I felt Faraj's gaze move to us, though he looked quickly back at his empty plate and pretended not to be listening. Of course not. That's ridiculous. Is it? I teased. Jamin's gaze softened for a fraction of a second, but Thorn came between us and lowered a steaming plate of black beans and rice onto the table. Irina followed shortly after, adding a plate full of scrambled eggs and a tray of neatly cut fruit slices. Argus skipped into the room, his missing tooth on full display. I waved. I'm sitting next to Valerie, Argus yelled as he wiggled into the seat beside me. Faraj snickered from his seat beside Jamin, and I could tell from his smirk that he'd not only been listening, but enjoying our conversation quite a bit. I decided I liked him. Is CL coming? I asked. She's on duty this morning, Irina said simply. Too bad, she was my favorite of the bunch. Thorn rubbed his hands together, eyeing his plate. My, my, Lily, we're fortunate beyond measure on this beautiful day. I mentally flipped through my files from yesterday, but I came up short on the name Lily. It wasn't like I had a lot of memories to sort through. It must be some kind of religion. I had no idea how hungry I was until I took my first bite of egg. But after that, it was as if I was a crazed beast shoveling piles of food down my throat as quickly as possible. Everything burst with flavor, from the citric tang of the fruit to the savory eggs. I might have felt embarrassed by my unladylike display, but Argus had abandoned his utensils in favor of his hands, and Faraj had shifted his head into his hawk form, literally pecking at his plate. I was equal parts disgusted, fascinated, and amused, and I could see from Irina's gentle smile that she enjoyed the three of us as well. I think if Jamin could have gone the whole breakfast without talking, he would have, but Thorn and Faraj were naturally chatty and knew how to get everyone involved. Still, Jamin said the minimum and hurried out as soon as he'd finished his meal, saying he needed to relieve CL from her post. He couldn't get out of there fast enough, and it was obviously because of me. I'd struck a nerve, and I was pretty sure I was right about him breaking and entering, too. But none of that information endeared me to him. If anything, he hated me more now. The worst part of having no memories was never knowing where I stood— and to compound the problem, these people had memories of us together that I didn't. Mr. Sexy over there actually felt justified in his salty attitude, and he might have been. I didn't know either way. I was more than happy to see Jamin trade places with CL, even if that meant I'd have to start my trial Valkyrie training. I closed my eyes for a moment, silently begging, "'Please start me off slowly,' Don't toss me directly back to the dark place. I wasn't ready to face it again, and I wasn't sure I ever would be. I thanked Irina and Thorn for the breakfast, and they shooed me out to the balcony to wait for CL. Argus had yawned enough times during breakfast for Irina to suggest a nap, so Faraj had taken him home, leaving me to soak in the morning sun alone. Only I wasn't alone. Standing on the balcony leaning against a column, was the Valkyrie I'd only seen on the tapestry, the one with the olive-colored eyes, the one known as Ajax. Chapter 8. Valerie You're Ajax, I stepped out into the sunlight. He smiled and held his hand out to shake mine. Yeah, you and I used to be really close, Val he said as I reciprocated the gesture. His accent dazzled me. But the nickname he used for me threw me for a second. I supposed it was an obvious one, but none of the others had used it. I tucked a strand of hair that had broken loose from Irina's pins back behind my ear. He watched me with a mixture of tenderness and suspicion, which seemed to match the reactions of the other Valkyrie. His olive-green eyes glinted, and a memory slammed into me. You're familiar, I said. Oh, it must be hard for you trying to feel out where you stand with everyone. Very. Maybe you can help me out. Where do I stand with you? 
He cracked his neck. I don't have a lot of time, but I was wondering if you could give Thorne a message for me. I gestured over my shoulder. He's right inside if you want to... That's okay. Can you just tell him Lily says hi? I nodded. Sure, that's simple enough. He hopped up onto the banister. Wait, I called. Not to be weird or anything, but I think I dreamed of you last night. I said, hoping that the sheer boldness of it might compel him to show his hand. He flashed me a smile, and instead of offering an explanation as I'd hoped, he said, Likewise then leaped into the sky. I was content enough that I'd just won Valkyrie Bingo and had at least met them all. Ajax was a bit more difficult to read than CL or Farage, but no more so than Thorn or Irina. And I wasn't sure where to begin to categorize Jamin. I wasn't getting much closer to figuring out who I was, but at least I'd met the whole Valkyrie team. I turned and headed back to the dining room to deliver the message to Thorn, but it was Irina that I ran into first. She looked up at me, a stack of dirty plates balanced on one hand. Is Thorn around? I just met Ajax and he... The plates shattered against the marble floors. Irina's wide eyes and panicked expression seemed outside of her character. Are you okay? I looked around for a broom to sweep up the scattered ceramic shards, but there was nothing but a few vases and a bust of some figure. You must be mistaken. I shifted. Oh, um, maybe. That's who he said he was. Where did this happen? Where is he now? I saw him on the balcony, but he flew away. He wanted me to deliver a message to Thorn. Her voice was sharper than I'd ever heard it. What was the message? Thorn rushed in. Is everything okay? I heard something break. Valerie just saw Ajax. Irina stammered. I swallowed, suddenly aware that what had seemed like a casual conversation might have been anything but. He... Irina swallowed. Go on. My gaze moved between Irina and Thorn. He told me to tell Thorn Lily says hi. Silence filled the room, and it felt like the walls were pressing in on us. Irina's gaze was locked on the floor as if she couldn't bear to make eye contact. Thorn was a statue, but there was no trace of emotion on his face, just a vacant stare that deeply unsettled me. I made the snap decision not to tell them that I'd dreamed of him before we'd even met, Thorn's eyes narrowed. If this is some kind of trick, I swear to you, I'll... Irina held out her hand to stop him. What's going on? I asked. They shared a look, and then Irina shook her head. Thorn took a deep breath. It's nothing for you to worry about. Are you ready to fly? Ciel is probably ready for you by now. I wanted to protest, to demand to know what was going on but Irina shot me a warning with her eyes, so I held my tongue. Considering they all claimed to be friends of mine, they all seemed to be hiding things from me. Did they not trust me because I'd lost my memory, or was there another reason? Thorn led me out of the dining room and back to the balcony. Outwardly, he seemed okay, but when he picked me up to take me to see CL, I felt his heartbeat race against my shoulder. I wish I knew what he was feeling. Scared? Angry? Sad? Whatever it was, it seemed to be tearing his body apart. Tell Thorn Lily says hi. It seemed like an innocent enough thing to say, but what did I know? Even Irina seemed to be set off by the mere mention of Ajax. I hoped CL would be more forthcoming, but so far, all I really had to go on was my notebook— and that seemed to imply that Ajax was the most trustworthy. How much could I really trust the other Valkyries? Chapter 9 Valerie Thorn flew me to the field where I'd first met him. CL was waiting there, but her smile dropped as she read the tension on our faces. Thank you for the ride, I said. 
He gave me a half-hearted smile before he took off back the way he came. Did something happen? CL asked. I turned on her. I'm getting a little tired of all the secrets. She put a hand on my shoulder. I get that, and I know it must be so confusing. It's just a little unfair because everything that happened after you left here is a secret to us, you know? I want to know about Lily. She sighed and shook her head. Uh, you should ask Thorne about- Why? Why all the secrecy? Some stories aren't mine to tell. That's not it. You won't even tell me about me. It's just complicated, Valerie. Frustration filled me, and I took a wild shot in the dark. Why does Jamin hate me? She looked away. I promised him I wouldn't say anything. I asked him if we dated at breakfast, and everyone got weird. Her gaze swept over my face. I balled my fists in frustration. You have to give me something. Anything. How about Ajax? She sighed, her agitation beginning to show. He vanished the same night as you, and no one has seen him since. Really, because I just met him a half hour ago. What do you mean, you met him? Her voice was sharp, accusatory even. I was waiting on the balcony, and he showed up. She turned away. In Lux? She breathed. That's impossible. I didn't leave my post at the rupture until Jamin arrived. I shrugged, but she wasn't really speaking to me. I recognized him from the portrait in the castle, so I assumed he was just another person to meet. She rubbed her hands over her face, then spun to me. What did he want? What did he say? I, he, he introduced himself. He knew you lost your memory? I froze as I replayed the conversation in my head. He had been the only person that hadn't seemed surprised by my lack of memory. I assumed he was part of the crew and that someone else had mentioned it. But if not, how could he have known? CL's brown eyes widened. There's more. He told me to deliver a message to Thorn. Lily says hi. Her face drained of color. It was as if I'd slapped her. But I was more prepared for an extreme reaction this time. CL sat down on the grass, her face turned away, and her gaze distant. I sat in front of her, leaning forward to grab her attention. Don't you think it's better if you clue me in a little? I mean, I could have called for Thorn or Irina if I had known Ajax had been missing. He's not missing, she said flatly. He betrayed us. I stared back blankly, unsure of what to make of it. He had seemed so casual. She took a deep breath. Okay, let's start at the beginning. All souls pass through this realm eventually, some only for a moment and others for thousands of years. I nodded, settling in to finally put some pieces together. The dwellers who linger here are split into two parts— their best traits and tendencies go to Lux, where we live, and their flaws and shortcomings go to Nether, the Dark Realm. She paused, and I hoped she wouldn't stop there. Thousands of years ago, an event occurred, and the wall that separated the two realms ruptured. Seven individuals were granted gifts that helped them defend those who lingered in Lux until they were ready to move on. You were one of them. Then Ajax began to change— it was like the darkness called to him. His wings began to change, and he started to say crazy things about the Riven. How they were good, stuff like that. Then, a year ago, there was a solar eclipse that plunged Lux into darkness, and the Riven overran us. In the end, we all lost something. I shifted as CL let the weight of her emotions slip into her voice. When the dust settled... There were lives lost. So many I couldn't save. There was a Valkyrie defending the rupture that night. One that could have stopped the Riven from coming through. If he wanted to. Ajax. She nodded, and a gust of wind pushed her hair into her face. Him showing up here like this. It's confirmation of what he did, although we always suspected as much. 
Her eyes darkened, and she leaned forward, lowering her voice as if the words were painful to speak. But, Valerie, you were gone all that time, too. And you were also unaccounted for the night of the eclipse. It doesn't look good that you both resurface out of the blue. I swallowed hard. You think I'm a traitor, too. That's just it. I don't. I know you too well. Sure, you were impulsive, and it was no secret that Ajax had a thing for you. But you wouldn't have put people you love in danger. You're a protector. I had no words of defense to offer, no justification. I had gone missing along with a traitor and had turned back up at practically the same time. It didn't look good. I hadn't even told her about the dream. How could she possibly believe in me when even I thought I sounded guilty? No wonder everyone was defensive. I get it. Thank you for telling me that. She got up to her feet and helped me up. You ready to train? She asked, gaining some of her spirited nature back. But my thoughts were elsewhere. Can you walk me through that night, from your point of view? Her shoulders slumped, but her demeanor was more cheerful than it had been earlier. She looked around and pulled a wheat stalk from the field. Tell you what, she said, grinning. If you can take this from me, I'll tell you my story. Chapter 10 Valerie Turns out I suck at fighting. I wasn't sure what I had expected. I didn't feel like a warrior, but I'd hoped a little muscle memory would have kicked in. Instead, I had flailed about while CL had moved with the grace of a trained dancer. Take the wheat from her? Yeah, right. It would have been faster to learn to farm and grow my own damn wheat stalk. My muscles ached, and I lay awake, distressed by how much worse they'd feel in the morning. I wasn't getting anywhere with training, but at least CL had opened up to me a little. I considered that progress. My lights began to dim, and I was hopeful that my body was finally starting to relax. My front door slammed open, and I shot up, nearly bumping my head on the loft's ceiling as my muscles cried out in protest from the sudden movement. The riven... My body tensed as I peeked over the edge of the loft, but all I saw was Jamin standing in the corner of my kitchen, fuming. I exhaled my irritation and lay back down. Back again, I see. What do you want this time? A quick rummage through my underwear drawer? I need to know exactly what Ajax said to you. I mean, every single detail. Who can I talk to about having my locks changed? Furious footsteps stomped up the stairs, and he sat at the edge of my bed. I felt an involuntary flutter at his closeness, but I was unamused by the intrusion. I eyed him and pushed up onto my elbows. Hey, your wings are gone. I retracted them. Where do they go? I asked, leaning around to see his back. Away. Now answer my question. I sat up to get my first good look at his face, and he immediately broke eye contact, letting his black hair fall over his eyes like a shield. The wound on his neck I had spotted yesterday was completely healed, and he was even more handsome up close, a trait that irked me. The smell of spearmint filled my nose, and when his gaze returned to mine, its softness took me by surprise. There was tension between what we had once been and what we were now, and my lack of memories barred me from understanding. CL had shed light on why everyone was wary of me, but Jamin had been considerably more of a dick than the rest. At least they were trying to trust me. At least they didn't break and enter to get information. If secrets were the currency in Lux, I certainly wasn't going to hand them out for nothing. Tell me. He pushed. My pillow smells like you. Do you want to tell me about that? Fine. If you tell me what happened with Ajax. He introduced himself and asked me to give Thorn a message. And he still had wings? I nodded. They looked different, like bat wings. Anything else? 
My thoughts jumped to the dream and how Ajax had said, likewise, when I told him about it. But Jamin was already suspicious of me. No, that's it. His gaze moved across my face, and I worried he might be able to see through me. The sadness in my eyes vanished. Finally, he nodded, and I felt the tension ease. So? My pillow? He stood and started down the stairs. Jamin! He ignored me, and if I wasn't so sore, I would have marched down the stairs and beat his ass for reneging on our trade. He paused with his hand on the front door. And without looking back, he said, We use the same detergent, and disappeared into the night. Disregarding my sore limbs, I hobbled down the stairs and locked my door with far more force than necessary. Ugh! I put my back to the door and slid down, slumping into a pile on the floor. Once the tears started, they were difficult to stop. But instead of fighting it, I let myself fall apart. There had to be some kind of mistake. I wasn't a Valkyrie, and I couldn't prove myself to these people because I didn't know if I was innocent or not. I don't know why it was important to me. Whatever I'd done to Jamin specifically must have been bad, as he was dead set on hating me. Didn't I have a family? A life before I had died and arrived in Lux? Isn't that what CL had meant when she said that every soul passes through here? Just like everything else, those memories were also gone. I may not remember my life, but it was hard to imagine that I had ever felt more alone than I did now. By the time the sunlight poured through my window, signifying that a new day had arrived, I was certain I couldn't face it. There was a knock at my door, and I heard Irina call for me, but I didn't move. After a few minutes, she left, but a couple of hours later, she tried again. I felt a little better by late afternoon, and just as I considered venturing out to find food, Farage knocked on my door. Valerie, he called, halting me. I have your lunch. I yanked open the door, ready to finally eat. My stomach dropped when I found myself face to face with Jamin. Farage gripped Jamin's wing and moved him forward. Say it, he demanded. Jamin winced. I'm sorry I broke into your apartment, he recited, and that I ruined your diary. If it helps, I didn't read it. I crossed my arms. Farage cleared his throat. I promise to respect your personal space and privacy. Farage peeked at me around Jamin's wing. Why did you do it? I asked. Jamin shifted. Because whatever happened before doesn't matter anymore. I knew his implication would have hurt if I'd known what exactly I had lost, but I was perfectly fine with forgetting all about what I'd found in my diary. If that's true, why are you such a dick? I expected him to sling another harsh remark at me, but was taken aback by the hurt in his intense eyes. Farage yanked him out of my doorframe and stood between us with a forced smile. Okay, glad we've made up. He looked back over his shoulder. You can go now. You're off the hook. Air rushed into my apartment as Jamin flew away, but I didn't feel victorious, just detached. An awkward silence passed as Farage pressed his lips into a line. How about we get some lunch? I nodded. Okay, but I don't want to train anymore. How about we just hang out instead? I'll take you to your favorite place. He could have called me a quitter or tried to guilt me into training, but instead, he offered me a piece to the puzzle. A favorite place of mine. Maybe it was because I was desperate to feel like I belonged somewhere, or because Jamin had me feeling particularly vulnerable. But as Farage smiled and pulled me out of my gloomy apartment, it wasn't so difficult to imagine us as friends. Chapter 11 Valerie. Farage must have known I was apprehensive about flying in the talons of a giant bird because we walked to the castle for lunch. All through the afternoon, he chatted to me about nothing in particular, and I suspected he was trying to give me a break from my first few turbulent days. 
I don't know if I had always been socially inept or if my lack of memories had left me with little to talk about, but it never felt like work when he was around. There was always one person in a group who has the heart, and Farage certainly fit the bill. We walked from one balcony to the other on the outskirts of the city, and dwellers nodded to us as we passed. The wind pulled my hair from the back of my neck and cooled me, and I closed my eyes to embrace the caress of it. I turned my palms out and tilted my head back as it pressed against my skin. When I blinked my eyes open, Farage was watching me. What? I asked. I think you miss it. Miss what? Flying. I simpered. If that were true, I'd probably enjoy being carried around more, but it's terrifying. He pulled his loose hair back into a low bun with such little effort, I knew it must have been routine. It's not the same. When we carry you, you rely on us. When you're flying, you're in total control. The world opens up to you. He chuckled. You used to say, the ground is a cage and the infinite sky calls to us all. That's why we crave open spaces. I liked the sound of it. I liked the version of me that believed those things. We walked aimlessly through the city, but Farage still managed to steer us to the bridge that divided the city from the fields where CL had attempted to train me. The moment we were across it, he banked right. We walked along the cliff's edge, enjoying the setting sun. Aren't you worried the Riven will find us? Jamin and CL are both on the rupture tonight. Besides, we're not going to stay too long. I nodded, but I couldn't get the image of the dark monster out of my head. I'd only seen one in a flash of lightning, but my lingering fear was the reason I knew I could never actually be a Valkyrie. I told myself I would never venture out of the city at night, but Farage seemed to have dragged his feet all day just to make sure we'd arrive after sunset. Yet something about his presence felt familiar to me, as if my memories of him were just out of reach. Farage, I said finally, why are you being so nice to me? He considered it for a moment, then said, I'm sad to see what our family has become. Does that mean you don't think I'm a traitor? His eyes narrowed playfully. Are you a traitor? I shook my head in surrender. I don't know. Jamin seems to think I am. My mention of Jamin brought a smirk to his face, but it faded quickly. Some memories are a heavy burden to bear, and now Jamin has to carry them alone. Ajax was one of us, you know, family. I don't think any of us saw it coming. This last year, we've all tried to heal and make peace with what happened to him and to you, but your return opened up old wounds. For me as well. I appreciated the candor and wished there was something I could do to ease everyone's pain, especially since I'd caused a lot of it. I didn't even know if that had been intentional on my part or not. The wheat fields grew steep, and my legs were still sore from yesterday's training, but Farage seemed to be struggling a bit with it too. The good news is, he said, wiping the sweat off his forehead, there was no one who held our team together quite like you. After all, you were the heart of it. That's funny, I'd already riddled out that you were. My breaths grew labored, sweat sliding down the back of my neck. Farage huffed, practically gasping between words. We're almost to the top. My muscles turned to jelly from the relentless overuse. Are you trying to train me without me knowing because... I doubled over. I'm starting to catch on. Sorry, he said through a laugh. I don't usually come this way without using my wings. He gave up not ten feet from the top and lay on the side of the hill, waving me on. It's your favorite place, anyway. I crawled to the top, not ashamed of how out of shape I was, but desperately focused on reaching the apex. The moonlight shone on the blades of grass like thousands of shooting stars, and when I looked back over my shoulder, there was still the smallest touch of pink on the horizon behind the city. I got to my feet for the final step and pushed myself up to the highest point. I blinked my eyes with disbelief, unable to push away the illusion before me. 
There was no way of telling where the sky ended or how to differentiate it from the mirror image below, except that when the wind blew, part of the starry landscape shuddered, and the other beamed proudly in victory. What is this? Farage stepped to my side. It's a salt flat. It seemed a wasted moment to look away. I stepped onto the smooth, glassy night sky, and it rippled away from my foot. Go on, Farage whispered. I walked across the stars and felt the cool water seep into my shoes, but it didn't matter. Each step farther out stirred lost memories, like flower petals caught in an afternoon breeze. I reached down and swept the shallow pool with my fingers before reaching up to the sky to do the same. A drop fell from my fingers into infinite space, landing like a single note of a grand piano. I started to dance with the constellations and splashed the water to mix it with the night sky. The more I let go, the more I felt Valerie return. I spun faster and faster until I toppled over, drenching myself in the sky. I lay there panting until my breaths were even, and then I made the long walk back to the edge of the salt flat, where Farage beamed. As I approached, he nodded and said, Welcome back, Valerie. I pulled my arms into my chest, but not because the breeze cooled the beads of water on my skin. I wanted to hold on to the bit of myself that I'd found. Farage walked me back in satisfied silence, and it wasn't until we returned to the city that I realized I'd forgotten to be afraid. Chapter 12 Valerie The next morning when I awoke, my thoughts were consumed with the eclipse, as if I'd been dreaming about it but had let the images slip away. All of the Valkyries were hesitant to trust me, given what happened that night, especially since I had my own story locked away somewhere inside. But as much as I longed to know what had happened to shake everyone's trust, there was one mystery that haunted my thoughts more than the others. Who had I been before I had become a Valkyrie? Did I have a family? A home? An entire life I couldn't remember? What had come before Lux? I sat up and began pulling pink strands of damp hair out of the braid I'd fashioned it into after last night's bath. The thoughtless activity might have otherwise lent itself to remembering, but in my case, I found myself wondering which Valkyrie I'd spend the day with. I began jotting down some notes about what I'd learned so far, but stopped when I heard muffled voices outside my door. I just don't understand why I have to be the one to ask. I heard Jamin say. You haven't even given her a chance, Irina said. You weren't there when- So sorry, I was busy bleeding out. There was a pause, and I tiptoed down my stairs and inched over to the door to hear them better. There was a loud knock, and I nearly knocked a plant off the small table by the door. Did anyone knock softly around here? Damn, am I just jumpy? I forced myself to wait a few seconds before opening it so as not to give away that I'd been listening. Then I prepared to greet the pair. I opened the door with a smile. However, Jamin stood alone in my doorway. The scent of spearmint sent a tingle through my body, and I fought to keep a neutral expression. The sunlight haloed his head and the tops of his wings, making his already striking appearance that much more difficult to ignore. I fought to keep my gaze from his bottom lip as he chewed on it, his gaze transfixed to the floor. Whatever I'd done to the guy, he was obviously struggling with it. Of all the Valkyries to show up today, Jamin was the one I wanted to see the least. Can I help you? He straightened. The Valkyries are hosting a party this weekend at the palace, and I'm here to invite you. So do it. Do what? Invite me. I thought I did. No, you only told me that you were going to invite me. He sighed. Would you like to- Sorry, I can't really hear you. He stepped closer, and suddenly his gaze burned my face. I crossed my arms in front of my chest defensively. Valerie, he said in a low voice. I turned away, hoping to stop myself from blushing like an idiot, 
but he caught my chin and turned my face back to him. His dark eyes softened, his gaze so warm that I was sure he was going to kiss me. His next words were barely a whisper. You look so much like her. He sighed and his hand dropped away, the cold, hard expression that he typically wore returning as he stepped back. My exhale came out shakily. Can I ask you something? He shifted. Look, if it's about you and me. It's not. Good. Do you want to come in for breakfast? I have some things I want to ask you about Lux, or rather, what came before it. He looked back over his shoulder as if he was hoping someone else might pass by so he could pass the task to them, but his shoulders quickly slumped in surrender. He pushed past me with a sigh and headed into the kitchen. Sit. I'll cook. The last thing we need is for you to burn this place to the ground. A smile tugged at my cheeks as I took a seat at the island and watched Jamin produce a pan, a bowl, and a spatula from the cabinets I'd yet to explore. His black wings blocked my view, so I couldn't figure out what he was making, but it was obvious that, whatever it was, he'd cooked it in this apartment many times before. I wondered if the softness I saw in him earlier was how he'd always used to look at me, but of course, any topics related to our previous relationship were triggers for him. This was the first time he seemed to be able to stand being in the same room as me. So, I said finally, what happens before we come to the Lux realm? Everyone is born in the mortal realm. They live their lives and then die. Some pass through the Lux realm in a second and move beyond, and others, like you and everyone else here, Linger in this realm until they're ready. Ready? His arm bobbed out as he stirred something in front of him. It's different for everyone. Some are trying to experience something they missed in life. Others aren't who they need to be yet. So I could move on and recover my memories from life? Yes, but... He stopped looking out the window like he'd find his words there. You should give it a little time before you decide. It's not something you would have done. It was a comfort to know I had the option and that whatever I had lost would come back to me eventually. Why would anyone choose to stay here without their memories of life? What about you? Why do you stay? He grew still, and I worried I might have overstepped again. You don't have to answer that. It's okay. I, uh, I stay to protect this realm and everyone passing through from dusk and the Riven. And Ajax? This time, when he went silent, I knew there was no recovering the conversation. So I let us drift easily into silence until a sizzling began to fill the air. As the sweet aroma wafted through my apartment, I rested my head on my arm and closed my eyes as a yawn forced its way through me. Jamin started to hum. A smile teased at the corners of my mouth, but when he began to sing, the smile took over my face. Fly until you reach the silver lining. Keep your gaze fixed on the sky. His dulcet voice calmed my spirit like a soft blanket wrapped around cold shoulders. His tone was so beautiful. I held my breath out of fear that I'd disrupt him. The feeling of home washed over me like a wave, even without the memories to inform it, and I drank in every note. Reach out a hand for the silver lining. I sat up, a tear slipping out, just as the words came to my lips. And remember the reason we fly. The notes came out differently than Jamin's. A harmony. We'd sung it together before. I was sure of that. I reached for the memories, but like waking from a dream, they slipped away with the last note. My gaze rose to Jamin, who stared with such intensity that my heartbeat stuttered. His eyebrows were raised, his face bright and hopeful. You remember? I, for a second, I thought I could almost... He turned away so quickly that I got a gust of wind in the face from his wings. He turned back a moment later dropping a plate in front of me that landed a little too hard. 
I gaped at the three fluffy pancakes. This looks so... I'm going to get going, he said, dropping the pan into the sink and heading straight for the door. What? You're not going to eat with me? I'm not hungry. Sorry. You don't have to leave, I said, but his hand was already on the door. CL said to bring your dagger to training today. Jamin! The door closed between us. Any frustration that I might have felt was instantly snuffed out when I took a bite of the pancakes. The soft cakes were perfectly balanced, with explosively tangy blueberries hidden away inside. I sighed. This was my favorite, wasn't it? I couldn't buy a normal interaction with Jamin. Every conversation was a cocktail of pleasure and pain. I didn't know why I couldn't remember my life or afterlife, but I hoped it wasn't for the sake of a clean slate, because that was not what this was. As I ate my pancakes alone in my all-too-quiet apartment, all I wanted to do was to thank Jamin for the bit of comfort, the bit that he'd immediately taken with him with his sudden departure. Chapter 13 Valerie I felt a little sluggish after eating the pancakes, so I took my sweet time washing the dirty dishes. My thoughts drifted to the melody Jamin had sung and how the lyrics had found me so easily. I hoped training would be the same, but so far, I couldn't seem to find the warrior in myself. I took a stroll around my apartment, acquainting myself with some of the objects I hadn't explored. There was a jar full of hard candy, some knickknacks, and a dead houseplant, but overall, my findings were as blank a slate as I was. After a few minutes, I realized I wasn't exploring so much as avoiding one object in particular. My dagger. It's just a tool like a fork or a spoon, but more like a knife. After circling the desk area more times than any sane person, I mustered the courage to pick it up. I knew as soon as I lifted my dagger that at some point I was going to accidentally impale myself. There was nothing natural about the weighted blade or the threatening sheen of the sharp edges. I waved it gently through the air, deciding I was a lost cause. They were all wrong about me if they thought I could plunge it into the riven. For starters, I'd have to be a foot away from one to even reach it, and that thought alone made my legs turn to jelly. Secondly, what the heck were the riven even made of? Would a blade just squish into them, or were they steeled and hard? It made my stomach turn, and I prepared myself for the resurgence of the world's best pancakes— I hadn't gotten a good look when I first arrived, but I knew a terrifying monster when I saw one. CL wasn't crazy enough to bring me anywhere near the rupture, right? Once that idea and the dread that came with it sunk in, the weight of my dagger seemed to double. The day she forced me back in there was the day I'd officially resigned from Valkyrie training. I carefully placed the dagger back on the desk— or maybe I'll just resign now and save everyone the trouble. I glared at the blade and could swear I could almost hear it snickering at me. Before I could investigate, my door swung open and CL stepped through. She had her hands on her hips and was wearing a bright, determined expression that instantly cheered me up. Her gaze moved from me to the dagger, and she snorted before snatching the dagger and hooking it on her belt— then I saw two little hands push aside her massive wing and peek at me. Argus! He was fiddling with his hands with his head dipped as he said, CL said I could watch you train today, so long as you say it's okay. Can I? Of course you can. I felt immediately ashamed that my first thought was that if he watched, we couldn't possibly be going to the rupture or facing any real danger. Argus pushed past CL and wrapped me in a hug. CL peeked around my apartment as subtly as a warrior with a sword and two giant wings could. It smells like pancakes in here. Her eyes bulged. Was Jamin here? No, I mean, yeah, but only to invite me to the event this weekend. She smirked. Is he warming up to you? Not one bit. 
Her bright eyes seared into me, and I felt a little exposed. I sputtered for a topic change. So, uh, where are we training today? Lusterwood Forest. Any chance we can walk there? She pressed her lips together, but I could see a guilty smile struggling to break through. I grimaced. Well, you can't carry us both, can you? She shrugged. Argus really only counts as half. I didn't want to think about the logistics of this flight, but after the salt flat that Farage had shown me, I was eager to see more of Lux. I followed CL and Argus outside, and the sun instantly beat against my skin like a friend's encouraging hand on my shoulder. So, how's this going to work? I'm going to carry Argus, and you grab onto my shoulders. Won't I be in the way of your wings? Not if you grab them in the right spot. Holy crap, I'm going to die. Again. Wait, what happens if I die again? CL lifted Argus. You won't, I promise. Argus watched me carefully, as if he'd only just remembered I was not the same as the Valkyrie he knew. I let out a defeated sigh and walked behind CL. She stretched out her wings, and I was thrown off at how stunning they were up close. They were gray with a pinkish hue toward the tips that complemented her hair color. See where they dip? Just above my shoulder blades? I humped in agreement. Grab on really tight right there. I reached out and stifled a gasp when I touched them. They were soft, the feathers growing smaller around the bones, but I could feel her muscles stretch with every tiny movement. Even with her massive wings fully extended, it was hard to imagine her lifting the three of us off the ground, and I had no idea how I was going to hold on if she somehow managed it. She dodged my death question, and I had a feeling that for the moment, that might have been a wise choice. Chapter 14 Valerie I doubled over as a new wave of vomit surged from the back of my throat onto the lush green forest floor. CL patted my back sympathetically. That's it, I said. I live here now. I'll just make a home here in the forest, never to fly again. You big baby, Argus teased. Come on, you didn't even die, CL said. Are you sure? The moment she took off, my scream halted in my throat. In silent terror, I held on with pure survival instincts. Every flap of her wings threatened to toss me into the abyss. Each sudden rise or drop was felt at the pit of my stomach, which now seemed to be taking its revenge. My heartbeat raced in my chest, with no signs of slowing as I retched the last of my stomach's contents on the leafy ground. I was sad to see my delicious pancake breakfast escape me, but when I finally stood upright on my weakened legs and drank in the glory of Lusterwood Forest, I instantly knew that I wouldn't be able to regret CL's little flight from hell. The vibrant green canopy filtered beams of sunlight through to the forest floor where we stood. The forest stretched as far as I could see in every direction— replete with scattered patches of colorful flowers and vines that wrapped around dark tree trunks. The entire wood glittered with fresh morning dew, as if each leaf was covered in crystalline stardust. Movement in the corner of my eye drew my attention, leaving me with a fresh mouthful of fear. I squinted through the errant rays of the sun, but other than the birds that flitted between branches, there was nothing there. CL followed my gaze, and I watched her reaction to gauge if we were in danger. This forest is special, she said, but it won't hurt you. She turned her gaze back to the trees. Valerie lost her memory. She'll need a few minutes to adjust. The wind blew and the trees shifted, the sound reminding me of a hard summer's rain. Then, just where I'd seen the movement before— a figure peeked around one of the trees. I gasped as it slowly stepped out into the open. It was shaped like a woman, but made up of tiny droplets of dew hovering closely together. When she stepped into the sunlight, the droplets splashed shades of light across the leafy ground like a prism. What is she? I asked. 
My gaze moved to Argus, who watched with wide eyes and his mouth agape. If he'd ever seen this forest before, it must not have been recently, because he looked as stunned as I felt. It's the spirit of the forest, manifested in the mist. Hi, I said, waving sheepishly. I'm Valerie, apparently. The shimmering figure bowed, and between blinks, more figures appeared like diamond sculptures as varied in shape and size as the citizens of Hakari City. I returned the bow, and when I looked up, the figures had dissolved. Argus spotted a tree stump and raced over. This is so cool, he yelled, taking a seat. A mist figure popped up beside him, messed with his hair, and vanished. CL unhooked the dagger from her belt and handed it to me. This is an excellent place for training. You can practice wielding your weapon against the mist. I won't, uh, hurt them, will I? Nope, and they won't hurt you either. I'm sure they'd just be glad for the company. We used to have a bridge that ran from the city to all of the islands like this one, but one bridge is easier to defend. Oh, how I wish there was a bridge home. Hush, and show me your battle stance. I lifted my dagger and bent my knees. She winced and walked up behind me. She kicked one of my feet out to lower my stance before she grabbed hold of my arm. She guided it along with the dagger. Now you sort of slash it like this, she said, but the movements were twice as awkward with her puppeting my arm. She stepped back and sighed. I'm sorry, I said. I'm trying. It'll take me some time to... That's not it. It's my fault. I use a sword, and it's so different. I'm not 100% sure how you do this. A laugh tumbled out. This mission is feeling a little hopeless. Can you pick someone else to be a Valkyrie? Because I'm not really sure if I can pull this off. I was surprised to find the resignation in her eyes stung me. But why shouldn't she give up? Fighting, flying, and whatever else Valkyries did didn't seem to suit me. In fact, I was having trouble finding any bravery in myself at all. Like this, Argus called. I turned to see him ready for battle with a dagger-sized tree branch tightly gripped in his hand. Even with his thin arms and small frame, he looked powerful in his stance. He pulled his arm back, shifting his stance before slashing through the air. That's great, Argus, CL said. Do you know any more? Argus grinned, crossing his arms over his chest. I'm Valerie's number one fan. I know all of her moves. Chapter 15 Valerie The silent walk back to my apartment spoke volumes. As painful as it was, it proved merciful. No one wanted to admit that I wasn't getting any better, and for the first time since I arrived, CL's sunny disposition had dimmed to a dreary overcast. Argus leaned in and gave me a side hug as CL turned her tired eyes on me. You'll get there, she said with a forced smile. I nodded. Yeah, we were lying to each other. I could tell from the sadness in her deep, sable eyes that it hurt her even more than it did me. I had no real idea of what I'd lost, but Argus had lost a hero, CL had lost a friend, and I wasn't totally sure who I even was to the rest. It may have felt like my second day of training, but it wasn't. I couldn't get into my apartment fast enough, and when the door closed behind me, the silence numbed my body. If I wasn't doing anyone any good in this realm, why not move on? Isn't that where I'd find the rest of my family? I didn't remember my reason for becoming a Valkyrie, and regardless of how badly everyone wanted me to be one again, I couldn't keep letting them down like this. A knock at my door jerked me from my thoughts. I opened it to see CL holding my dagger. You forgot this. Thank you, I said, taking it. I stared down at the blade to avoid the look of defeat in her gaze. You miss her, don't you? She raised an eyebrow. The real Valerie. Her wings twitched. 
I just think if it were me who lost my memories, you would know exactly what to do. Thorn said there's another eclipse coming. You wanted me to fight with you, but I'm letting you down. Her gaze dropped. I admit that I thought it would come back faster. My throat started to constrict as I fought to keep emotion out of my voice. Should I just move on? Her response came out as a whisper. We need you. Her gaze lifted to mine, and I nodded my understanding. She lifted her hand in a half-hearted wave before heading back out into the night. I drew myself a hot bath and waited until the mirror was completely fogged up before I got in. The water was so hot that it pricked my skin when I moved, so I stayed still staring blankly at my feet across the tub until it cooled and I began to shiver. I swiped at the mirror and stared at the stranger looking back at me. What I saw was a girl with blue eyes, dark skin, brown hair with pink tips, and the droopy gaze of someone without hope. I forced a smile, bigger and bigger, until my cheeks stung. All right, Valerie, I don't know if you're in there or not, but I could really use your help. She never answered. I collapsed into my bed, promising myself I'd make pancakes in the morning. I let myself drift off to sleep, but it wasn't Valerie that showed up. It was Ajax. I stood on an open, grassy plain, the one that stretched for miles outside the city, when I saw a winged figure walk towards me in the distance. He was too far away for me to identify immediately, but by the time he was close enough for me to make out the green of his eyes, I knew I was once again going to meet the missing Valkyrie. My first instinct surprised me. Fly to tell the others. He reached out a hand. Wait. Val. It's okay. With each move of his body, a trail of ashy darkness followed. He was dressed in a black suit that complemented the dark rim around his cat-like yellow-green eyes. His wings were made of exposed bone and crimson feathers that seemed more threatening the closer he came. I froze as he drew nearer. Why are you still here? He asked. I looked around at the swaying grains. Where am I supposed to be? Nether. Did they tell you that you chose to be in Nether with me? No, they hadn't, but it didn't mean I was going to trust the guy with the scary bone wings. I swallowed a lump in my throat. They told me you betrayed them. The wind picked up, whipping my hair into my face. Why wouldn't they tell you that? Maybe they're hoping this time you'll make a different choice, but they don't know you like I do. A powerful gust pushed hard against my skin, and I covered my face with my arms. I heard the whisper of Ajax's voice be swept away by the wind, and I fought against the gale that pushed so hard that I began to slide backward. A weight landed heavily against my back, and I felt the extension of wings as they spread. I lifted into the air, and with a sharp gasp, woke suddenly in my dark apartment. I sat up straight, reaching for my back. I exhaled a relieved sigh when I didn't feel a single feather, my thoughts turned to Ajax. The last time I'd dreamed of him, he'd shown up at the palace and thrown everyone into a panic. Maybe it was a sign he'd return again. I have to warn them. Without hesitation, I threw on a sweatshirt and sandals and ran out of my apartment. I bounded down the street through an alley and turned a sharp corner, stopping at a white door. I slammed on it with the back of my fist until I heard something shuffle inside— a moment later, the door swung open, and the smell of spearmint filled my nose. My gaze went immediately to Jamin's shirtless body. The moonlight highlighted his muscular form. Heat burned my face as I briefly forgot why I'd come. I froze like a statue in his doorway until he wrangled his shirt all the way on. I shook free of my daze and looked up at his knitted eyebrows and dark, penetrating stare. Valerie, are you okay? Recovering, I blurted. I saw Ajax in my dream again, and I was worried he might come back like last time. You dreamed about him before? 
Yeah, and then he showed up. He poked his head out of the apartment, looking both ways up the empty street. How did you find my apartment? I... I had no freaking idea. A smile broke on his face. You don't know. Something fluttered at the pit of my stomach. Excitement from remembering something. Do you want to come in? No, I said, too quickly. I'll take the couch, and you can sleep in my bed if you're too- No, I'm fine. I just wanted to tell someone in case he comes back or something. Actually, I think I'll head to the palace to let Thorne know. Can I walk you to your apartment? It's on the way. My gaze dropped to the ground, and with the moon's light behind me and my shadow cast across Jamin's floor, I caught a glimpse of the world's most embarrassing bedhead. I cringed internally. After you, I said. He slipped on his shoes, and the second his back turned to me, I feverishly combed at my hair with my fingers. If Jamin noticed my efforts or cared, he didn't show it. In fact, he seemed so distracted as he gazed vacantly down the street that when I reached my apartment, he barely nodded goodbye to me when I thanked him. Satisfied that I'd done my duty and pleased that I'd somehow remembered something, I rewarded myself with the instant replay of Jamin's bare chest, putting those five seconds on loop in my head as I mentally presented it with a first-place medal for my favorite memory. Chapter 16 Valerie if Irina had put me in a fancy dress for breakfast, what was I expected to wear to a party? I scoured my closet, only to find the dress I had worn to breakfast and a strappy purple number that was short in the front and tapered down in the back. I liked the color almost as much as the flattering way it hugged my body. Still, no matter how I arranged my hair, I couldn't get comfortable in the ensemble as a whole— I ended up being 20 minutes late and sweaty from running back and forth from my closet to the mirror in the bathroom. I surrendered to the party gods and threw on my favorite pair of jeans and a plain white tank top. I'd rather be comfortable tonight than be in a dress. I liked the asymmetrical design on the jeans, how one side had two black straps wrapped around that I thought jazzed the look up a bit, but I wondered if Irina would be offended that I hadn't made more of an effort to look nice. I had been on edge the whole day, half expecting Ajax to pop up out of nowhere, but the day had passed just like the one before it. I had a lousy training session and an awkward goodbye with CL. The memory drew my attention to the kitchen island where my dagger rested. Why couldn't I get this? My gaze lingered on the cross guard, then drifted to the black strap on my jeans. Interesting. I walked over to the blade and lifted it before slipping it gently into the two straps on my jeans. I secured it by adjusting the straps and moved a little to test its security. And here I thought the straps were a style choice. I set out to the palace under the gossamer light of a half moon. Even though the walk through the city to the palace was a bit of a steep hike, I could already hear the music and laughter floating in the air. A shadow passed over the moon, and I spun to see Thorn land beside me. He smiled wildly, the tips of his pointy ears highlighted by the moonlight. A bit of my nervousness eased when I noticed that he was dressed casually in a pair of slacks and a flowy, loose-fitting shirt that showed off a bit of his muscular chest. There you are, he said, tucking his red-tipped wings behind him. We were worried you might have had another run-in with Ajax. I tugged at the bottom of my tank top. Luckily not. I'm sorry I'm late, but I couldn't decide what to wear. Should I have gone with a dress? He giggled, and I could smell something sweet and spicy on his breath. This is more your style. He nodded towards the palace and held out his arm for me to hook with mine. How is training going? he asked as we walked briskly up through the winding streets. I just can't seem to get the hang of it. He nodded, but his smile was bright and easy. I'm told by the others that you're starting to remember things. Give it time. 
Do we have time? Someone mentioned another eclipse. Three months is not enough time to learn everything again. Our only real chance is to help you remember. I just feel like there are so many secrets. So many things I don't understand. There's a good chance I never fully recover my memories. Or at least not before the next eclipse. You're still Valerie. How do you know? Because what you're really afraid of is letting us down. You were tossed into this world without a clue of who you are or who you could trust. I can't imagine how lost you must feel. Yet you're still here, still willing to try and learn enough to help us. And that means you are very much the same Valerie we lost a year ago. My eyes pooled with tears. Thorne stopped short and put his hands on my arms. Cheer up. It's a party. I want you to let go of everything and just enjoy yourself. You don't need to know about the past or worry about the future. Pretend you're meeting everyone for the first time. He grabbed my face and shook it playfully. Can you do that? Yeah, I said, biting back a smile. Thanks, Thorn. I felt the tension in my body ease. A party. Just a party. A chance to get to know everyone again. A chance to have a good time and not worry about anything else. For the rest of the walk, Thorn fueled my excitement by telling me about the food and drink that was being served. I made a mental note to get my hands on some sole cream puffs and to drink slowly when I try the Bramberry Ale. The music and laughter grew louder as we neared, and when the palace finally came into view, it brimmed with joy and life. What excited me most was that unlike on most days where my schedule kept me far away from the citizens of Hikari, they all seemed to be in attendance. Crowds of dwellers chatted on the verandas, the doors spilling warm light onto the cobblestone. I felt a flutter of nerves and excitement. Energy seeped into my skin, fueled by the glittering display. I followed Thorn through the double doors, smiling and waving as the crowd split to let us pass. There was an abundance of infectious goodwill that filled every shining inch of the palace. A waft of nectarous air drew my gaze to a slender woman that passed with a silver tray, and I eyed the golden pastries stacked neatly on it. Thorn raised an eyebrow, and with a smile, I hurried after the woman, ready to eat my weight in dessert. Chapter 17 Valerie Thorn hadn't exaggerated. The light, buttery pastry filled with sweet lemony cream was as close to heaven as the afterlife had offered me yet. I'd sheepishly reached for my fifth one when a group of dwellers started calling over more trays of delicious foods for me to try. A shrill screech drew my attention to the large hawk that glided smoothly to me before shifting with a crunch back into Farage. So here's where all the food is, typical Valerie. The crowd giggled. You found me. He wrapped his arm around me and waved over a tray of clay goblets I assumed were filled with Bramberry ale. He grabbed two and handed me one. I eyed his muscular arms and ripped chest, which was only covered by a sash. I'd worried about my attire, but everyone seemed to be wearing whatever happened to suit them. He tapped his goblet to mine, but waited for me to taste my drink before he followed. I sipped the purple liquid. The sweet and spicy mixture had a hard tang that tickled all the way down. The fizziness lingered on my tongue, and it took everything in me not to down the rest of it in one go. This is amazing, Farage laughed. It is, but don't have more than four, or you'll feel it tomorrow. How many have you had? He winked. Mm-hmm. I stood on my tiptoes and could see C.L. chatting with someone across the hall. It was difficult to miss her or Thorne's giant wings over the crowd. Irina was harder to spot, with only one wing, which she kept tucked tightly behind her at all times, but I spotted her by the others. Before I could invite Farage to come with me to greet them, the music shifted to something more up-tempo, and he held his hand out for me to dance. I tilted my goblet back and downed its contents. 
My muscles relaxed almost instantly as I set the empty cup on a passing tray. Faraj smiled and did the same before taking my hands and leading me through the crowd to the center of the ballroom, where the music was loudest. Faraj spun me, and I erupted with laughter as I let myself sink into levity. I felt the sudden rush of wind at my back and arms wrap around me. CL bounced to the rhythm, and the three of us held hands and danced. I closed my eyes, letting the music take me, and felt the unharmed bonds between me, CL, and Faraj that could not be erased by a lack of memory. After three songs, we'd worn ourselves out. My damp shirt clung to me, and I could feel sweat dripping down my back. CL nodded to the veranda, and Faraj and I followed her. On our way out, we passed Thorn, who was busy snacking on soul cream puffs with Argus and Irina, who watched us pass with a pleased smile. The cool night air was a welcome change from the stuffy ballroom, and I took a seat on the bench beside CL next to the banister. I looked around for Faraj, but I'd lost him somewhere in the crowd. Are you having fun? CL asked. I wiped the sweat from my face, my chest still heaving. Yeah, I'm definitely a party person. Hey, Faraj called, drawing our attention to the three goblets he held over his head. CL and I cheered as he doled them out to us. Cheers to us, the greatest dancers at the party. I snorted, talking through a mouthful of the fizzy drink. Silence settled between us as we cooled off. So, uh, where's Jamin tonight? Faraj sat up and gasped. Oh, crap! I was supposed to take his spot at the rupture. He sipped his drink and leaned back. Well, he hasn't come to drag me over there yet, so I'm sure he'll show up here all huffy any minute now. CL's eyebrows raised. Why do you ask, Valerie? You got a thing for him or something? Of course not. I was just curious. Farage smirked. Can you at least admit that he's a beautiful man? I shrugged. No more so than anyone else here. What's up with that? He sipped from his goblet, but only lowered it a little to say, everyone looks more or less how they see themselves. And that's why Thorn's ears are pointy? Farage spit out his Bramberry ale, his laughter soaring above the music. Don't call him out on that. CL nodded. He's really sensitive about them. She smiled, her gaze drifting out to the endless drop on the other side of the barrier. You have to admit that you remember things better when you're around Jamin. Irina said you found his apartment. I nodded. Yeah, but... I shook my head, sipping the ale to give me time to gather my thoughts. I think I hurt him worse every time I see him. Plus, he doesn't trust me. Why would I make an effort with someone that's so moody all the time? Faraj shrugged. To be fair, he only became that way after you left. It's not like I left on purpose. My voice came out harsh and defensive. CL and Faraj exchanged a glance. Faraj asked, Is that true? I... I don't know. CL put a hand on my knee, as if the gesture would soften the words. He seems to think you did. Faraj tilted his empty cup back, peering into it as if the liquid would automatically refill itself. He stood and said, I suggest you cut him some slack, and I'm going now to go take his place so you can have a little party time with him. Wait, no, let's hang on a little more. I just got here but Faraj was already lost in the crowd. I finished off the last of my ale and pouted beside CL. Are you and Faraj a thing? I asked bluntly. She chuckled. No, I know he prefers men, but I've never seen him date anyone since he's been here. I think he's searching for the real deal. And you? She leaned back on her elbows. I'm searching for the real deal too, I guess, but the way I see it... I need to test out all the wrong ones to find them, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I said, grinning. Now I know we're best friends. I wanted to rejoin the party, to spend a little more time getting to know Irina and Thorn. 
They seemed almost like parents in the way they interacted with the rest of the Valkyries, but had kept more of a watchful eye on me rather than being actively involved. CL and I people watched for half an hour before the temptation of the silver trays filled with dessert called me back to the party. We'd almost reached the double doors when I felt the familiar gust of air behind me. Jamin perched on the banister and hopped down onto the veranda. His gaze was fixed on CL as he marched over to us so intently I could practically see smoke coming out of his ears. Where is he? Farage? He left to relieve you like a half hour ago. That prick was two hours late. His gaze moved to me, and heat crawled up the back of my neck. CL handed him her drink. Relax, man. You made it. Your girl is still here. If looks could kill, CL would have been riven food from the hateful glare Jamin shot at her. She smiled back as if she'd won some kind of contest. Wait here. I'm going to go request a song, she said, heading back inside. I stole a look at Jamin, and while his neutral expression blocked me from any insight, the tension in his arms and shoulders suggested he was as uncomfortable in my presence as I was in his. I felt the fizz of ale at the pit of my stomach, liquid courage urging me to break the ice. Want to make out? If I hadn't seen it myself, I wouldn't have thought him capable of that big of a smile. But once he started, he couldn't stop, which meant I couldn't look away. He looked down at me the dark feathers on his long black wings swaying in the breeze as he bit back a smile. He nodded to my goblet. And how many of those have you had tonight? The amusement in his voice was on full display. My chest warmed. Was he flirting? I mean, I knew I was, but was he? A few, I said, feeling the electric pulse as he smiled down at me. There was something still alive between us, and maybe for the sake of a party, he was actually going to let his guard down. His silver armor glinted in the moonlight, giving him an ethereal glow. Oh yeah? I couldn't tell. Cheers, I said, bumping his cup with mine. I liked the way his gaze lingered on me. I liked whatever hormones it sent through my blood that made me feel euphoric. Cheers. We drank, and I couldn't remember if I'd had two or three drinks. Faraj's warning echoed in the back of my mind. You look pretty, Jamin said, but his smile faded. You should have seen me in the dress I was going to wear. The purple one? He said with a chuckle. You love that one, but you never wear it. It was subtle, but this time when he spoke, I noticed he was moving closer, it was an odd comment, and I was struck by the reminder that everyone in this party most likely knew me better than I knew myself, Jamin in particular. What else do I like? I could see a torrent of responses spinning behind his eyes. Please let your guard down. Let me in, I begged internally. But I regretted those thoughts a moment later, because if he hadn't let his guard down he would have noticed the threats creeping up behind us. Chapter 18 Valerie A gasp from a party member was our only warning. I spun to see Ajax standing on the bench where I'd been sitting most of the night, his green-yellow eyes blazing. Jamin stepped in front of me, and his sword burst into an icy blue light. Good work, Val, Ajax said, stepping off the bench. You got them all here, just like you said. Jamin turned his face toward me, his eyebrows knit together, but his gaze stayed firmly on Ajax. How did you get into Lux? Jamin's voice was as cold and sharp as his blade. Ajax grinned. I think you know the answer to that. A lump lodged in my throat. It couldn't be me, right? Jamin stepped forward, spreading his wings, but Ajax didn't so much as reach for his loaded sheath. I just thought it was only right to invite some of my friends to the party. 
The music halted, and desperate screams filled the ballroom. I turned, and my legs carried me straight into the fray, right toward that which frightened me more than anything. The Riven. Perhaps if I'd gotten a good look at them before, I would have run the other way, but instead I fought against the herd of terrified guests that were fleeing the ballroom in a panic. I felt the rumble of battle in the air and heard the groans and snarls of dark beings. Above me, CL flew into view, her sword lit with an orange glow. A riven reached for her, hurtling through the air with outstretched claws. Vicious gray fangs jutted out from its bear-like snout, and its long curved claws reached for her, its hind legs outstretched as its body, a mass of black fur and smoke, shifted winglessly through the air. CL dashed to the side at the last moment, using the beast's own momentum to push the raging monster through the skylight. Thorn slid back, shouting, Get out of here! while holding back a greedy claw, suspended by his double blades only inches from his face. A loose beast tore toward a man who crawled in the direction of the door, his limp leg trailing blood on the floor behind him. I was frozen between running away and running to help, but before I could decide, someone else had made their choice. Argus sprinted toward the monster with a silver serving tray as a weapon, my body moved, and I bounded across the room with a singular purpose. I didn't remember pulling it from the straps, but my dagger was wrapped tightly in hand as I ran for the blind side of the riven. I dropped to my knees and slid in front of its hind legs, thrusting my dagger into its belly. It crunched and popped, not like flesh, but like concrete, and my arms shook to hold the blade in place. While the beast screeched and thrashed, I caught a glimpse of Argus backing away to safety. A wave of relief hit me before I fully knew what I had done, and before, with the last desperate flail of its life, the riven's talon pierced my shoulder. Pain rang through my head like a bell, drowning out my call for help. The flesh on my shoulder burned as my body was pinned to the ground by the corpse of the beast. My breath faltered, half shock, half fear and everything went dark. This has been Eleven Wings Book One, Valerie, written by Brittany Chanel and performed by Brittany Goodwin. Stay tuned for the next book. Fly until you reach the silver lining Keep your gaze on the sky Reach out a hand to the silver lining And remember the reason we fly Fly until you reach the silver lining Keep your gaze on the sky Reach out a hand to the silver lining and Remember the reason we fly